So welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show on YouTube and Progressive Radio Network and opedus.com slash podcasts at iTunes and Stitcher. My guest today is Greg Palast. Greg is a, I'm going to read this, even though I've had him on the show going, I've, I mean, the first time I interviewed you, Greg, was I think 2003. We go back a long ways already. It's amazing. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and, and damn, this is still the same problem, but we'll get, let me do the intro first. Greg Palace is an investigative reporter whose news breaking stories appear on BBC television, the guardian, and now in Rolling Stone magazine. He's put together a movie, best democracy money can buy a tale of billionaires and bandits. And I got to tell you, I was kind of getting ready to watch this and see a dry election integrity movie like I've seen before. This is a kick-ass movie. I mean, I, it, it, it's sort of like um, what Michael Moore does. I mean, it's, it's just a brilliant movie, great visuals. It's fun. It's, it's powerful. It's dynamic. It's, it's entertaining. Um, so congratulations. You've done an amazing job. You're very welcome. Yeah. yeah well, I, I want to just keep you entertained at least. I mean, <laughs> there's no reason why the truth has to be dull and boring, you know, like it is on the petroleum broadcast system. You know, <laughs> I had you in mind when I made the film. I want to keep it, keep it hot. So, Besides, you got Rosario Dawson in the film and Shailene Woodley, and you know, so like, hey man. Can't keep your eyes off the screen. And that's just the start of the list. Uh, I was it was fun to see Ed, Ed Asner in the, in it and uh, yeah, Santa Claus. He was even though it's a documentary, we do have Santa Claus in there. But it, it's uh, it, I, I don't want to uh, destroy your illusions. But there is no Santa Claus. It's actually Ed Asner in a Santa outfit. And, and, and there's no honest vote counting either. Same same category. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Santa, bring us all, bring us fair elections, please. So give me the kind of elevator pitch for the movie first, and then we'll get into it in depth. Uh, it's real simple. This is how a bunch of big, bad billionaires shoplifted this election in 2016, how Trump stole the election, not him, uh, not Agent Orange himself, but his cronies and his operators who made sure that uh, people that they didn't like, voters of color, couldn't get to the voting booths. And that's it. Baby, it ain't the Russians. The Russians don't need to teach the Republicans how to eliminate black voters from the voter rolls or jerk with your vote. Um, that's a story. It, and yeah, it's, it's entertaining. It's, it's, uh, we have cartoons uh, by uh, Keith Tucker. Wow. Yeah, cartoons by, by, like, so you have Saturday morning cartoons inside the film like, uh, by the guy who drew, who framed Roger Rabbit and um, Keith Tucker, and, and obviously a lot of stars make their way in, but it's really following me on my investigation for Rolling Stone on how Trump was going to win the election. It was originally released in September, Bob, before the election, and it didn't get an, a lot of attention because people said, Hillary's already elected, you know, we've already got our seats at the inaugural, we've booked the hotel rooms, we've blown up, you know, we've We've uh, blown up all the balloons and uh, Hillary's elected. What do you mean Trump's going to steal the election? And remember, we made this film. We started with uh, knowing Trump was going to steal it um, a year and a half early. We knew he'd get the nomination, too. And I had you on my show back then, and you predicted this. And is it exactly what you said? Because we don't look at the polls. We look at who counts the votes and who controls the voting mechanism, who controls the voting lists which is serious, that's what we don't get a lot of in, in the US, is this issue, we still don't let black people vote, at least at the same rate as white folk. Uh, that's the core of the film, really, and it falls me on my investigation, uncovering how they steal 2016. So we've updated, we've updated now to include the kind of I told you so. So first thing I gotta say, if you're looking at me and I'm not looking at the screen, it's because I'm taking notes. I just can't stop that habit. I've been doing it for too long. Okay, just watch the film. It's already a note for me. <laughs> we also have a book, The Best Democracy, that goes with it. The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, a Tale of Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. I know a lot of people have uh, bought the original Best Democracy Money Can Buy, which was about how, uh, how um, Bush stole the election. But uh, the, uh, the new one was nothing. That came out 2002 or 2003, right? The original. Now, this is 2016, 17. 
Yeah. So, you know, I, I finally got to meet you face to face uh, on Sunday at the Left Forum, which was great. And you gave a, a really powerful talk there that uh, kind of adds to what the movie says as well. The movie kind of sets everything up, makes it clear just what was going to happen. You predicted it 100%. And uh, now you're talking about how it happened. And so tell us what happened. What, what Tell us the details of it. And also, you got this John Ossoff elect election coming up in less than two weeks uh, in Georgia. You've got some important information on what's going on there. So get us up to date and give us the big picture of where we're going with all of this. But one last question. One last question. The Intercept just the other day uh, announced a leak by somebody who was an independent contractor working for NSA about how the Russians had attempted to corrupt the election by uh, doing something, looking, checking in, uh, hacking voting officials. And if, so let's start with that. What, what, do you, what do you got on that? Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, if, um, one thing, uh, if you go to gregpalace.com, you'll see a report did for Democracy Now! in, uh, in Ohio, just before the election, uh, the couple days before the election in November. We found, Something shocking. I was actually in the chamber of the of a judge in the state court in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, in that meeting in the judge's chamber. So it wasn't unfortunately it wasn't out in the public where you could get a uh, transcript. But I'm not barred from discussing. In the judge's chamber, the state officials and county officials in Ohio, Republicans, said that yes, they had re they had literally turned off. You'll love this, Bob. They turned off the software on their voting machines, which would allow you to track whether someone tried to hack it. Now, there's a simple logging mechanism. They turned that off on the voting machines. They also turned off uh, another voter security element. The, it's not, the new electronic machines actually can take a, a photo of your ballot uh, in order and number them. And actually, they should do that, print them out, and therefore you'd have a, an effective paper a uh, paper trail that goes with the computer. They can do that. Well, they decided not to print out the extra, the paper version of your ballots. You can look at it and say, yeah, that's it, and put it in the lockbox. That would be the safest system. So they use in Venezuela. Uh, if they can do it, I think we can work it out. Um, but even worse, they simply turned off the entire tracking mechanism and the anti-hacking detection software. I kid you not. I mean, this is in the judge's chamber. These are the officials. Did they give a reason for it? Oh yeah, they said if we turned on the anti-hacking software, if we put on uh, the uh, the uh, if we photoed the ballots and kept them uh, secure, um, that would uh, create havoc. It would it would be a dis it would create mayhem. I said. Now I looked at the voting machines. And, and, uh, really? Yeah, and I found that what the mayhem is is that if when you turn on the machine. When you turn on a voting machine, you, you have choices, you know, when should, when does the voting start so that they, no one can put in a vote early, you know, things like that. And one of the questions they ask you, do you want a sequential record of each, of each vote? And the answer, and the, in Ohio and, and many of the Republican controlled counties, swing counties, they wrote, they pushed the button no. They're told to push the button no. And do you want a log system to, in, to detect any attempts to, hack the vote, to hack this machine. And they, again, push the button no. It's the difference between pushing yes and no. It's just a setup of each machine. They said that, that, that saying yes and saying no would cause havoc. What's the havoc unless someone's actually breaking in? So they literally, literally left themselves open to the steal. Now, did they steal? I don't know, because I, you know, I'd have to, like, you know, have little uh, GoPro cameras attached to the uh, heads of uh, of the Republican voting officials. But they sure left it open for a steal, and now we're being told the Russians attempted uh, attempted such a hack. So do we know if they were successful? Well, not in Ohio, because they turned off the vote, the, the hacking detection software. It's not that fancy. It's just a log of someone trying to break in. Yeah, uh, is there a reason to think that if they did it in Ohio, they did it elsewhere? Is there like a systematic uh, approach to this where some organization, some group in the movie you mentioned, the Koch brothers are behind the Manhattan Institute and there, there are layers and layers of, of 
people influencing this stuff. So do you think this is something that was done systematically throughout the nation, or at least in certain states? Here's my problem. I'm an investigative reporter, and unless I see the evidence, it's very hard. I just can say that they're vulnerable. That's all I, I can really say. But this I do know 100%. The voting lists were absolutely hacked. And that's where the key states were won, whether it's Michigan, um, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Ohio, North Carolina. Uh, the, this is where the real hacking occurs. See, people think it's some guy in, a Holly, in Hollywood uh, or some Russian somewhere in Moscow changing your vote from, from Hillary to Trump. That's, that's the Hollywood version. Uh, that's not generally how they do it. Uh, first, what they do is they stop voters that they don't like from voting. And in the film, the number one thing I investigate is something called interstate cross-check. Now, if you'll note, we have um, Donald Trump has appointed a guy named Chris Kobach. Chris Kobach of Kansas. And if you, you know, if you can't remember Chris Kobach of Kansas, just think KKK. And Chris Kobach of Kansas was uh, put in charge of Trump's Voter Integrity Commission to determine if, uh, if there were millions of illegal voters. That's like putting, the, uh, this guy, Chris Kobach, that's like putting Capone, Al Capone, in charge of investigating the mafia. Why? Because this guy, Chris Kobach, is the vote thief in chief for Donald Trump. He's the guy that, that led me to the conclusion that Trump could not lose. Now how? Not by hacking your actual vote when you walk into the machine, but by preventing you know, uh, black voters and Latino voters and Asian American voters from voting. How do you do that? You know, it's, it's uh, 50 years after Martin Luther King crossed the bridge at Selma, which is in my film. Uh, it is instead, uh, they, they do it through these devious systems. They accuse voters of color, for example, of voting twice. And that's the key thing. Now, when Donald Trump says the election was rigged, he knows because his guys rigged it. And specifically when he says that there are three million people voting twice, there wasn't one goddamn American reporter who asked for the goddamn list of the three million voters. They said, oh, it's nonsense, it's not, yeah, it's not true. Yeah, it's nonsense and it's not true that there are three million people voting twice. But why don't you ask them for the list? I did, and at first they said no. But as you know, you see my hat, I'm an investigative reporter. I got the list. I got the list, my friends, of their three million, three and a half million so-called double voters. And when you look at the list, it don't look like double voters to me. It's got a lot of guys named James Brown and David Lee and Jose Hernandez. And those are the guys that are on the list and women like Maria Hernandez. And I'm not making this up. You got to see the film or read the book. I have the list. Bill, takes what could be a pretty dry topic, looking at an analysis of these lists, and you, you, it's, it's, it's like you use film technology like Minority Report to really take it and bring it alive. So Very expensive film technology. Yes, we use green screen. So I actually, uh, um, you know, I, I steal some ideas from, from Sensei. We use the green screen technology, for example. I actually dive literally into my brain and uh, while to kind of investigate while I'm looking through these lists, so you watch my brain process. And, and I really see it, like I get the list, and I kid you not, the list has, in Georgia, for example, 288 double voters. This is Trump's list. Understand, he actually has a list. 288 voters in Georgia alone named James Brown. And they said, this, these James Browns, are voting a second time illegally, that's a felony crime, in another state. So for example, how do they know that? Because they found James Brown in Georgia, but they also found, believe it or not, a James Brown in Detroit, and a James Brown in Virginia. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and then and a James Brown in, in, uh, uh, in Michigan. Now, now, how do they know it's the same James Brown? Well, if you look at the list, and again, it's in the, in the movie, you see it through animation. Um, well, because they, they say James Thomas Brown is the same voter as James Edward Brown. They say James uh, Brown Jr. is the same voter as James Brown Sr. I can't- They have first dates. And they, and oh yeah, so when you ask, and now I could, 
Now in the film, you'll notice I jumped this guy, Chris Kobach, who is now in charge of uh, the new voting, Voter Integrity Commission. I jumped this Kobach cat um, with his own list. Now, when you ask him, when other, other reporters have said, well, we heard this list is kind of bogus. He says, what do you mean? We have, we have birth dates. We know it's the same James Brown, we have birth dates. We have the last four numbers of their social security number. We have all this information. Yeah, they have all that information. But guess what? I also got the documents that say they don't use that information. So they have the social security numbers in some cases, not always. They have the, the uh, middle names and they don't use the middle names. And literally, I'm telling you, I, I, there's a, for example, 24, and I'm not making this up, it's right in the list, 24 guys named Mohammed Mohammed. The most common name in the world, well, not common for Republican, the most common name in the world is Mohammed Mohammed, but it, not a single middle name met. Mohammed Awais Mohammed, Mohammed Saeed Mohammed, 24 Mohammed Mohammeds in just the city of Columbus, Ohio, they've accused of voting twice. Now, they have their birth, they, they mismet, not a single, not a single middle name match on these Mohammeds. Two million, let me repeat that. We had experts going through, we spent a lot of time and did a lot of, we, we threw this through computers and uh, really took it apart. Two million middle names don't match. Hundreds of thousands of people who are junior and senior, father and son match the same voter. And sometimes it's a voter who simply moved. It's clear that it's a motor, voter who's moved and yet they say they're voting twice. Because well, I moved from New York to California, does that mean, and I didn't tell my secretary of state, oh, I've moved. Does that mean that I voted twice? They're pulling these people off the voter rolls. And according to our experts, we got, as you saw in the film, we got the guys from Amazon and eBay. And again, we didn't make this dull. You don't see a bunch of experts behind bookcases, except for Bobby Kennedy. I put him behind in front of his uh, law bookcases. Um, you don't, you know, we put them in, in virtual space where all the information is flying around them. So it's interesting. But out of all the interesting, cool effects, you find out that Damn, they have, uh, they've included a massive number of minority voters. In fact, the, the guy from who does the analysis of list street for eBay um, is on screen saying, my God, they have in some states, one out of five black voters is on the vote, is on this list of double voters, one out of five. Really one out of five black people commit the felony crime of voting in two states in the same election. That's the claim. And you might say that's laughable, it's a lie, it's bullshit. But here's the thing, that won the election. That won the election for Donald Trump because those names are removed from the voter rolls. Not all of them, they didn't remove three million voters. They removed about 1.1 million, maybe a little less, could be 900,000, but that's all you needed. In Michigan, the Secretary of State told me he, he was really aggressive in removing uh, voters from, uh, that were on that cross-check list. Donald Trump won that state by 10,700 votes, and we're looking at maybe 50 or 60,000 people removed because of cross-check, five times Trump's plurality. And again, it's voters of color because they have common names because they move oh they, they the reason why it's not all three millions they send you a postcard you don't return the postcard then you get removed and who gets these postcards the white people who may get caught up in this list suburbanites middle income people in their home for 20 years they get their postcards they they return them students poor people unemployed people people who rent and move place to place um, they don't even get their cards if they do they're unlikely to return them. they know this game so goddamn well. They just know it, Bob, and they, that's how they do it. And you don't have my fellow reporters in the wonderful white stream press. You have to understand we have an amazing amount of Jim Crow reporting still in, in America. You're not gonna see this on uh, MSDNC, not with the white hosts, and I praise those, uh, the, the hosts that will put this material on, but basically you don't get this at all. You get a little bit about voter ID or something like that, but no one, these guys have all swallowed the Kool-Aid. They've swallowed the Kool-Aid and they are saying that we have the most, you know, the zombies are saying we have the most wonderful election system in the world. No one has ever challenged the integrity of our voting system. <laughs> but in the film, we, you know, I expose it. It's 
hard facts. I have the papers, I have the documents, I have their internal memos. And then I confront this, this little dweezil, Kobach, the Secretary of State of Kansas, Trump's guy, who's now in charge of, he's rewriting our voting laws. Do you understand that he's rewriting the voting laws? And this dweezil, I, I jump him, because he wouldn't talk to me. And I have to understand, American reporters, when they're told, no, we don't want to talk to you, say, okay, they put down, uh, we couldn't be reached or wouldn't uh, respond, blah, blah. We don't do that. When I say we, I worked for BBC. I worked with Rolling Stone. I worked for The Guardian. And you saw my colleague at The Guardian, uh, Ben Jacobs, who was body slammed. Why? Because he's a real reporter. When, the, when that uh, SOB congressman, that, that, uh, that criminal uh, um, berserker, uh, refused to speak, said, get out of this office. Every single American reporter would have gotten out of the office. When, you, when you're told, get out of my office, and you're a Guardian reporter, you go into the office. And when they say, and he said, get that microphone out of my face, you, get, you put it right on their lips. And you put it right there on their lips. And, um, and that's how you get body blocked. <laughs> but that's how you get the answer. You make him respond. So Chris Kobach, I showed him his own list. And then he just started lying. Blah, 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 blah. It was a one lie after another. And you see it in, in the film. We actually illustrate the lies. And we blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so he starts lying. And he says, oh. I said, why do you have like, you know, like it was, I used an example of like, uh, why do you have Jose Herman Hernandez? And well, actually, there's a real, uh, let me give you a real one. Uh, Maria Cristina Hernandez was supposed to be the same voter as Maria Isabel Hernandez, that's, a, that's actually on his list. Same voter, supposedly. He says, oh, that, that voter shouldn't be on the list. No kidding. He put her on the list. And he says, oh, they wouldn't get those postcards. No, no, no. You say in your instructions, buddy, to ignore the, ignore the mismatches. That's a quote from their instructions, which I show in the film. You zoom in. That's their internal instructions, which we got our hands on. Ignore the mismatches. They were trying to get every voter they could get. And if the last name, in fact, our expert says your name is Jose Hernandez, you were suspected of voting in 28 states. Uh, and and it's, you know, it, it sounds crazy. It sounds nuts. And, and yes, it's true that our um, New York Times and uh, Washington is Vestia and the Post or whatever they call it, um, they, all, um, they all said it's all nonsense. But what they haven't gone further and saying, it's not, it's about not, you know, yeah, it's crazy. These aren't illegal voters, but what they're doing is, is it's an excuse to remove legal voters. Have any, That's how we knew they would steal this election and they did it exactly to the cookbook and method we predicted in the film. We laid it out. Pay attention, America. Have any of the mainstream media reported on the cross check information that you've been reporting on for the last year? Well, yeah, NBC, uh, I saw, had a, I was looking at some of the local news reports. They go, oh, look, we've got this wonderful system named, uh, called CrossCheck. And one NBC local reporter went to some college campus and said, uh, so went to some student and said, so, um, are you registered to vote in two states? They said, no. I said, are you, are you, from, you know, are you from Kansas? Uh, there was a Kansas school. And they said, uh, no. Um, uh, I was in another state. So you could register to vote in two states. And the student said, yeah, I don't, but I suppose I could. And you could vote in two states, couldn't you? And the student said, well, I, I don't know. I guess I could, but it's illegal. I wouldn't do it. So, and then the, you know, the reporter said, there you go. You can vote in many states. The students can vote in many states, you know? And it's like, no, that's not true. They don't. Show me these, these you go to, the, you go to prison as we showed in our cartoons, you go to prison for five years if you get caught. Five years. Felony crime. And um, have people been convicted of that? And so, like I say, um, I, we couldn't find at me, uh, Kobach is claiming he's got four. Now, I understand that there are million. Okay, so one, let's put it this way. He's got less than one out of a million people. For every million people that is on his list, and thousands and tens of thousands lose their vote. For every million people he has on his list, he thinks he has one double voter. And most, by the way, had not, were not caught by that list. Uh, we couldn't find a single one. I was just in Georgia. Not, they use that list to clean the voter rolls in Georgia. 
They admitted that to me, the Republicans. They don't have one, not one single case of a convicted double voter, yet they're removing people from the voter rolls based on this crime. Now we're talking about the Ossoff uh, election that's coming yes. up in two weeks. So they've cleared off how many voters in, in Georgia that could be voting in that election? Well, one of the problems is that they, they won't, okay, I got my hands. They didn't like this. I got my hands on the Georgia list. A half million people that they mark as suspected double voters. And, and so what they do is, and this is weird, if you're a double voter, they send you a postcard. Did you double vote? No, they, they, they say, is this you? And uh, <laughs> it's here committing a felony crime, you'll answer the postcard any way you want. But they literally say, okay, our big investigation method to see if, if um, and again, Maria Christina Hernandez, that actually is a Georgia voter, a real Georgia voter that said voted again in, in, in Virginia with a different middle name. Um, to determine if that was really a double voter, they sent her a postcard. And she didn't respond. Then it's like, oh, obviously guilty, remove her from the voter rolls. So that, and the card, by the way, is in English um, only. Um, it says in English only if you want a Spanish translation, go to this website. Um, but it's, um, you know, I'm laughing, but it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's, it's, it's Jim Crow in cyberspace, except instead of using white sheets to chase away voters in Georgia. They're using spreadsheets and it's more effective, it's insidious, it's quiet, and no one in the U.S. mainstream media. Now remember, when I say U.S. mainstream, because people say, you know, I am the mainstream. When I report for BBC, for The Guardian, this is the gold standard of journalism in the English language. Uh, no one, no one, I can tell you right now, no one in England or uh, Canada or anywhere takes like the New York is vestia, New York Times, they call it, uh, seriously. Um, this is the real stuff. And this is where I, I place my report. So I'm not locked out of the mainstream, just the U.S. mainstream. And that's, uh, that's the tragedy here because, you know, um, they, and back in, in 2000, uh, Rob, I, um, I, I was the guy who, who did the report for The Guardian and BBC that showed exactly how Catherine Harris and Jeb Bush stole the, the presidency for uh, George Bush, who won the presidency by just 537 votes in Georgia. That's, uh, excuse me, in Florida. That's it. He didn't win. The, the, the yeah. Supreme Court designated him. Right, he did, exactly. But here's what happened is that Catherine Harris, how'd they get 537 vote margin for this guy? Catherine Harris, and a predecessor, by the way, a Republican, removed tens of thousands, 94,000 to be exact, 94,000 voters from the voter rolls, accusing them of being ex-cons, felons, who are not allowed to vote in Florida. And exactly zero, and I want to emphasize this, exactly zero were illegal voters, not one. Not one of my goddamn American colleagues asked for the damn list of these so-called felon voters. I got the list. I got the list. And I, by the way, the NAACP sued and the state said, yeah, we, gee, we made a mistake. We're so sorry. They're laughing because they sent the apology letter from the inauguration, right? Uh, and well, wait, wait, I want to follow up with something though, because I asked yeah. you about mainstream media coverage of this story about cross-check. And I know that in the past, Chuck Todd, the director of political reporting for MSNBC, and maybe even NBC, at least MSNBC, which you call MSDNC, uh, he has basically said that this kind of talk is conspiracy theory. Well, you know what, I was gonna tell you something. Before I was a, an investigative reporter, I was an investigator, uh, including for the US Justice Department, specializing in racketeering, and, and an element of racketeering is conspiracy. It means people getting together in secret, doing something against the public interest. So I'm a conspiracy expert. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, was it a conspiracy that, uh, uh, that uh, Catherine Harris removed, illegally removed black voters from the voter rolls? Yeah, it probably is a conspiracy, Chuck. It's, uh, it, of course, the US Civil Rights Commission and Catherine Harris signed papers admitting she did it. So admitting to the conspiracy in the state, uh, you know, and this is one of the problems. They say conspiracy, not 
and it gets a, it gets a big laugh from the conspirators. So you know, Chuck Todd, for example, has never once asked. I mean, he didn't say Greg Palace was a uh, was a Greg Palace conspiracy because he never he never even bothered reading the Rolling Stone article. No, you know what? Here's the interesting thing. I've had some reporters on the lamestream press say, "What you know." Uh, uh, what's the evidence? And I say, here it is in black and white. Not one, not a single American newspaper reporter, television reporter, not a single one has asked me for the list. Not a single one has gone, has gone to these places and asked for the list, which they won't give you. They give all kinds of excuses, but not a single one has said, okay, show me the list. Show me these, these lists, these fake lists. They haven't asked. So how do, you get the story out? how do you get the story out? How about Netflix? Will you be, will this be on Netflix? I'd love to see it there. Well, at this moment, uh, actually, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, what I want to do is, is I want to do my next film. I am in discussion, the great Tom Ortenberg, who, who did the uh, film about the spotlight, about the, the, uh, uh, you know, the rape of little kids. Uh, by, uh, by, movie by 200 priests in, in Boston, 200. Now that's a massive, so you had, you had for years, massive, uh, on extra, talk about conspiracy. I mean, a massive cover up of mass rape by priests in Boston and all over the world. And here's the thing about the film Spotlight, okay? Notice the reporters actually had this information for 10 years. For 10 freaking years, the re these lazy ass reporters, and it was all about these wonderful reporters. They weren't wonderful to me, they should all be in prison. They abetted the rape by covering up this information, by refusing to take on the case. It's only when they're absolutely pushed by one courageous editor and by the, the, this Armenian uh, lawyer who just wouldn't stop and wouldn't stop and wouldn't stop. They kept calling him a nut and a crate and a conspiracy theorist, everything else. But it's this Armenian lawyer who just wouldn't drop it and finally pushed it in the face of the damn lazy, stupid, ignorant reporters who then got Pulitzer Prizes. So what about this? They, they should not be... Get, they should not have gotten Pulitzer Prizes. They should be in jail for, for covering up the damn crime until they finally couldn't cover it up anymore. No way, and, I, but you lost me. Now, the reason I bring up Spotlight is the guy that, that uh, put out Spotlight and finally busted that whole, you know, made, showed you how that happens. The guy that, that put out that story, Tom Ortenberg, great guy, is um, working with me now on our next film. So we're not done. Because he has a, because his uh, uh, company is uh, committed to getting out investigative journalism, the real stuff. So, well, this what is his, what was his role in what was his role in Spotlight? Uh, well, he was a distributor, uh, great uh, opener, and he got out. Uh, and previously, he had worked on the getting out the film Sicko by Michael Moore. So here's the thing. Yeah, we have some courageous people ready to take this on. But I have no, the funny thing is, is like, you know, in Britain, my stories go on page one. I get, I'm on the top of the nightly news. It's not that odd, you know, and, but uh, investigative reporting is what we do. That's why Ben Cohn, uh, Ben Jacobs, excuse me, was body blocked uh, by that uh, congressman in Montana. It would not have been a, an American reporter. Only a British trained reporter would actually go for the story and not give up. And that's the real story. That's it, not giving up. And ultimately, I will say one thing for those reporters in, um, in Spotlight, especially the young ones uh, who, who did not, were not previously uh, ignoring this, uh, this conspiracy of priests and bishops uh, to cover up the rape of children. Um, they show that it takes hours and hours and hours and days and days and weeks and months and of grueling, grueling work to get out a single valuable story, massively going through records. It took us five months to get these lists. They didn't want to give them to us. It took us 
It took us several months to have these things properly analyzed by experts and reviewed. It took us more months to go find people on the list. That's really expensive, really time consuming. There isn't a newspaper in America that will pay for it. Uh, in fact, the one thing about the film Spotlight is that that's it. They, they don't do that. No one does that anymore. Not, even the New York Times, all its How money. How do you pay for um, what you do? Hmm? How do you pay for what you do? This is an opportunity for you to pitch. Well, actually, the, the way I pay for it is the only way you can do it in America. Uh, the only way that you can do investigative reporting in America is the same way that Bill Moyers, ProPublica, and others do it, is that we have to get foundation. We have to have a foundation to back our work. So I have a foundation, the Palace Investigative Fund, and if you want to donate, it's tax deductible because we're nonpartisan and, believe me, very nonprofit. And uh, if you go to gregpalace.com and want to donate it, it is tax deductible. That is a pitch for the foundation. By the way, I haven't taken any money salary for three years. So uh, it's not for me. It's for to keep a staff alive that has to really do this work. It pays for the plane rides to go and find the victims. When I have these lists of, uh, of, of accused voters, you know, I, I go and meet them. And that, that's very important for the, to not only get put some, human a human face on this ugly uh story of removing black voters and removing uh asian american voters that's very important so we have to we have to do a tremendous amount of work to double check the facts to get the documents we even go undercover when i confronted chris kobach donald trump's guy in uh, uh who's running his uh, election integrity business and i confronted him with these facts about removing voters through this ugly system called cross-check. Um, we had, uh, I had a, he wouldn't meet with me. So again, I used what we would do in The Guardian and the BBC, I decided I'm gonna go find him. We found out he was gonna be at a, in a public park holding a Republican party fundraiser, a, 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 an ice cream social. And as we say in the film, you know, it's, <laughs> It's a, it's this white people's ritual. We, we wanted to, uh, and we wanted the chocolate ice cream, but all they serve is vanilla. <laughs> so, um, so, but I actually had to fly in, believe it or not. I flew in a war, uh, a war uh, correspondent photographer, a guy who's been uh, under fire from uh, Paris, France, flew into Wichita to film this because you have to, you're really like going in almost like a kind of war zone feeling. And you have to know how not to be afraid and how to kind of, we had to act like we were local. We had to first get through to the, uh, to Kobach, this uh, Republican official. Uh, we looked a lot like a local news team. I got one of the, you'll see in the film, I have one of those microphones that you hold in your hand, has a little cube on it. And it has the number four, like, uh, like channel four, uh, NBC US local news team. But actually I was working with Channel 4 of London, England. And so it wasn't really a phony, but <laughs> it was enough to make us look like a local news crew. And then I uh, got straight through to this uh, character, Kobach. And then he started running away from me. It's all on camera. He starts running away from me saying, liar, liar, while he's trying to eat his ice cream <laughs> at the same time. And, and even worse, one of his, uh, one of his uh, white people that were protecting him grabbed my hat and how dare you? That was that. Now talk about a crime. I mean, Ben Jacobs got his glasses broken. Oh, but you go without. Don't that. ever touch my hat. Yeah, you, that's your way of going undercover. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there's another thing I did. And by the way, you have to. And this is what this is what your donations to the Palace Investigative Fund pays for. Uh, most of it is, is the research time. Months and months and months of research and uh, terrific people like. Lenny uh, Bad Penny was our chief investigator. That is her real name. Um, and um, uh, Bad Penny, to, you know, she'll, she can go for days literally without sleep going through this material. And then, then when I go out to, to jump these guys or get these guys, uh, in one case, you'll see in the film, I have another hat. I have several of these hats. People ask me, is that one hat? I have several. And um, one of them, you'll see, actually has a little hole for a, a camera that we've sewn into the hat. And I kid you not, we use that in the film when I jump uh, one of these billionaires who's the secret money, the dark money behind, um, behind Trump. Remember, Trump only plays a billionaire on TV. He has to 
he, he needs real billionaires to talk about Fisher. Fisher. Oh, that was uh, no. In this case, it was um, uh, John Paulson. Not don't confuse him with Hank Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary from Goldman Sachs. J.P. John Paulson, otherwise known as the Foreclosure King. This guy is the guy who made five, count five billion dollars in a single year, personally, not his company. Him personally in a single year uh, for crashing the mortgage market in 2008. He's the guy who did it through a, through yes. Sorry, a conspiracy with Goldman Sachs to rip off the market. And uh, that conspiracy was confirmed by the Securities Exchange Commission, by the way. And so it's, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it is a, well, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact. And now you have a lot of now, now the, the SEC is caught up with, the, with my uh, information, bless them. And uh, though the new Trump Trumperized the uh, SEC, I don't know what they're going to do. But Nothing. real but, money. I actually keep a, a camera in one of my hats. But now you know the trick, so I probably can't use that one again. So you 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 have a lot of expertise on a lot of these nasty billionaires, you know. Now I've been writing a series for a couple of years now that we need to debillionaireize the planet. That billionaires have too much power. They're dangerous threats to humanity and the planet. And we need to basically pass laws that makes it illegal to be a billionaire, that it's too much power and too much money. Oh my God, you sound like Eisenhower. <laughs> when, when Dwight Eisenhower was president. Yeah, well, 90% the tax on, on the wealthiest Americans to 90%. 92. And. No, but, yeah. But I got a question on another billionaire. What about Robert Mercer? Now, Mercer played a major role in, in Trump, and I don't know that I've ever heard you talk about him. Do you have anything on him? Well, yeah. Uh, well, Mercer, the main thing about Mercer, uh, who had made his, he's a, he's a math whiz, okay, just to understand. He's, he's this, Cambridge he's, Analytics. Yeah, and, and well, he, he started Cambridge Analytics, which actually helps uh, and we go into film and these things, like there's a similar company called I360 controlled by uh, David and Charles Koch. And these are companies which track your behavior, have 1,800 dynamic tracking points on every individual in the United States, man, woman, child, and maybe dogs, but I don't know, I can't confirm that one. Uh, but, and they, for example, they'll, they'll look at your internet behavior, changing your credit card uh, bills, your, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just simple things like who do you vote for? And, you know, it's, it's very, very detailed and it's dynamic. That is, it's continually uh, updated. This helped um, uh, Trump do ultra micro targeting to get the voters he wanted. And it also can be used to discourage voters or as you saw with cross check and similar systems to challenge the right of some voters to vote. But the important thing with, with Mercer is what he wants. He put up the money. He provided the, uh, the analytics through his company, Cambridge Analytics, for Trump. But most important, the real question is, what does he want in return? And he wants what every billionaire wants, which is another billion. And there's no, there's no end to what these guys want, to their greed. In fact, I, I had a secret tape recording of Charles Koch's associates when I worked many years ago at the FBI. I was on the Koch's case in 1995, by the way, uh, 22 years ago, tracking these guys. And Charles Koch was caught by the FBI on camera um, stealing oil from, um, from an Indian reservation. And when I say stealing oil, you're talking about stealing uh, 10 bucks of oil a week from an Indian family that has a little stripper well on their property? on a reservation, the Osage Indian Reservation. So this is like, you're stealing, it's like candy shoplifting. And so one of Koch's, uh, you'll see in the film, I, I quote it, uh, one of Koch's minions said to Charles, why are you doing this? Why, why, why do you want 200 bucks from some poor Indian lady in a mobile home? Uh, you're already a billionaire. And Koch's response was, and this is important, Koch's response was, I want my fair share, and that's all of it. Really? And he used that phrase all the time. I want my fair share, but that's all of it. So Mercer's the same way. He wants all of it. And one thing that they don't want to do 
is once they have all of it, they don't want to pay tax on any of it. And so, for example, uh, the number one tax that, that Mercer has to worry about is something called carried interest. In fact, the government is claiming he may owe, he and his company may owe as much as $20 billion, okay, because they're playing games with the tax code. But it's something called, a trick they use called carried interest, which only applies to hedge fund managers. Now, what's interesting is Donald Trump brought up this loophole. Two candidates, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders kept beating on about this carried interest loophole because it only goes to millionaires and billionaires who are speculators. So like, uh, after all, you know, whatever else you think of Trump, casinos do hire people. Uh, casinos uh, are, are buildings that, are, that have to be built and, and staffed and maintained and they provide jobs and there's an, uh, you know, it's an industry. And so Trump was really, really angry that all these other guys these billionaires that he knew were all operating tax, virtually tax free through something called a carried interest loophole. And he said, this is deeply unfair. It's horrible. We've got to close it. And Bernie Sanders said the same thing. And finally at the end of the election, at the end of the debates, the said, oh, me too. But when, once Trump got in office, forget about it, Jack. He just came up with this big giant tax reform, which did not touch that massive, massive loophole for Mercer, $20 billion for Mercer and his company, $20 billion for Mercer. Got it. We also need to talk, when you're talking about Mercer, the, the reality that Mercer put Steve Bannon into the White House. Yes. And a lot of people are saying that Trump is so clueless that it's Bannon who is dictating the policy that Trump is signing off on. Well, Mercer owns the White House right now, some would say. Oh, yeah. And you understand... People don't understand where this Russia stuff is coming in. Let me explain that that's through Steve Bannon. And, and it's very important to understand the story of Steve Bannon, Mercer, and the Russians. Because it, no one seems to be talking about why is, why is Trump so in love with the Russians? The answer is um, that he has, he has completely bought hook, line, and sinkers, Bannon's idea, Bannon's crusade, which is his, his uh, uh, um, statements and his theory that there is a clash of civilization, that we are now at this uh, biblically predicted apocalyptic moment where it is the European uh, Christian civilization, in other words, white people, who are in a cataclysmic apocalyptic battle with the dark Muslim hordes. So it's, uh, it's European Christians versus uh, European Christians, meaning also white Americans, and also uh, versus the Muslim hordes. And so where does Russia come into this? Russia comes into this because Putin is the only guy, in their opinion, who has the balls to kill Muslims in, en masse. Putin is a made man with this crowd because he leveled the Russian city of Grozny in Chechnya and killed slaughtered 100,000, who knows how many, 100,000, 200,000 um, Muslims, Chechens, um, totally leveled his, a city in his own nation. It was a horrific mass murder of Muslims. And to Donald Trump, that was like, that guy, that guy has balls. And that's why uh, he even admires him, you know, when, when Hillary Clinton says, yeah, but he's back in that monster uh, but, uh, Bashir in, in uh, in Syria, says, yeah, but the Russians know how to kill, they know how to kill terrorists. They're really good at it. So he has this idea that because the Russians don't mind slaughtering endless numbers of Muslims, that, uh, that he's on our side in the cataclysmic battle and kind of gutless uh, Muslim Kenyans like, uh, like Barack Obama would never take on that, uh, that battle because, you know, you know, a Muslim kid from Kenya uh, is not going to take on the Muslim hordes. But that's, that's what Steve Bannon's role is. That's what Mercer's role was in pushing this, uh, this clash of civilization, us white folk against those, those dark Muslim hordes. What about the, the, this, this whole narrative that the Russians stole the election from Hillary? What do you got on that? Well, as I say, I mean, 
let's not go crazy with this Russia, Russia, Russia stuff. Um, it's, as you know, and as I've explained, it's, it's really been a mass vote purges, uh, not counting black votes. It's not even, it's not about, I, even this thing with the Russian hackers, um, it could be, I don't want to dismiss it, but we don't have uh, any clue yet or evidence whatsoever that they actually got into the voting machines. The whole claim is that the, the Russians um, hacked into the Democratic National Committee's computers and revealed the truth. I mean, it, it, it's a weird thing that, that the Democrats are saying, how dare they reveal our emails? They didn't say the emails were made up. Right. They were saying, how dare the Russians reveal what we're, what we're really doing behind the scenes? In a way, they're accusing Russia. How dare they in, inject truth into an American election? And the truth was, is that the Democratic National Committee conspired, oh, there's that conspiracy word again, conspired to destroy the Sanders campaign, which is against the DNC's own rules, and maybe against the, uh, the law. There's lawsuits on this right now. Um, so the Russians are accused of telling us the truth, and we're not used to the truth, so how dare they do that? Uh, it's, you know, uh, I don't like, even if they're doing it in the name of the truth or whatever, I do not like the Russians attempting to meddle, or any nation, foreign nation, attempting to meddle into our politics. I mean, the United States does this on a regular basis. I was down in Venezuela where we engineered coup d'etats. We engineered the coup d'etat in Honduras, and it uh, goes back to Iran where we engineered coup d'etat. So we, you know, we've overthrown many uh, elected officials. That, you know, but, but just because we've been bad doesn't make the Russians correct or good. They aren't. Uh, Putin is a fascist murderer with blood on his hands. We do not want him picking our president, but he didn't. Uh, he, yeah, he, he, did he try? Yeah. Did uh, he succeed? No. The, he, the Republicans do not need Putin's help on getting rid of black voters from the voter rolls. They, 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 they do a good well, do you believe, job about themselves. Do you, believe, do you believe the Intercept's article uh, that this young woman, uh, uh, her leak is, is accurate? Do you believe that that actually happened? Oh, yeah, I, don't, I, I know the Intercept people very well. Uh, Ryan Grimm is a fantastic uh, investigative reporter. And uh, I noticed that they're, that they're not calling him a conspiracy nut. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, there's no question that the Russians tried to hack into uh, Russian uh, fronts or operatives. Uh, it looks pretty solid that they tried to hack into some of the voting uh, software. Okay. Um, so, so I, I, I didn't out of time, and I got to cover a couple more things. So I wrote an article yesterday, basically saying that that at, that attempt is a, is a screaming indication that we need to get rid of all the electronic voting machines that we have in the United States and replace them with systems that use verifiable paper ballots. Well, though, yeah. <laughs> Um, and and you know, but not only that, Bob. What we saw in Michigan, where they did have paper ballots but they stop the count of those ballots. We have to not only have paper ballots, but we do have to count them and make them public. In Britain, you open all the ballots in a public gym and everyone looks at the ballots and knows what the, what the result is. They do the same thing in Switzerland. Now you commented on Sunday about how Jill Stein tried to get the ballots recounted, uh, have something done in, in, in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio, and that Hillary didn't even try. Al Gore did try. So what do you have to say about Hillary's response to this? Okay, do, do you know, I know Al Gordon maybe didn't fight hard enough, but he did go to the Supreme Court and challenge the vote in Florida as a, as a cheat. He wouldn't use my information. I know from inside that, because uh, Gore um, just says we hate that son of a bitch when they brought up my name. Um, so, yeah, because I'm don't. i not a, a, a joy to any party. But in the case of, of Michigan, for example, 75,000, 355 ballots, 75,000 and change ballots were never counted. So what Jill Stein was doing, we call it a recount, but in fact, she was trying to count the uncounted ballots. How, how do ballots get uncounted? Because the machines in Detroit, which is in a bankrupt city, could not, the, the state would not, the Republican state officials would not give new voting machines to Detroit. The, the set 87 voting machines broke down in Detroit, leaving uh, 75,000 ballots uncounted. Jill Stein said, let's count those ballots. Now, if Trump only won by 10,000 votes there, that's the official, and 75,000 votes in Detroit were never counted. Well, if you count those votes, Trump's lost. Boom, that's it. No question. 
Trump went to court when they're in the middle of counting those uncounted ballots, went to court, his lawyers, and said, Jill Stein can't have those ballots counted because no matter how many times you count those ballots, she ain't going to win. No kidding. So only Hillary Clinton has the legal standing to demand those ballots be counted. Hillary's lawyers are in the damn courtroom. The judge wanted to know if Hillary wanted those votes counted, then it could go through the count. Hillary's lawyers said, we're only here to observe. In other words, Hillary Clinton just let, just said, screw you to the black voters of Detroit and Flint who never had their votes counted and just said, screw you. And that is, been the Democratic Party line forever. They, they are very reluctant to, to defend the black voter because they're afraid that they will lose the white voter. Now let's talk about Bernie Sanders. You have some uh, uh, information and in thinking about him. Uh, let's start with California, what happened there. Let's talk about New York and anything else you've got on what Hillary and the DNC did to Bernie Sanders and from the, in terms of voting. Well, this is the one that... <laughs> This is the one that got me in trouble with uh, the Washington Post. By the way, the Washington Post praised me for my, I will say, uh, the Washington Post praised me for my work on cross-check. Uh, but, then, but then in California, where I was voting, I just moved to California, um, I just saw what normally is used on black people all the time. They're used on, on student voters and young voters in uh, California, uh, and which is that, um, they, they made it nearly impossible for independent voters to cast ballots in the Democratic primary. California is an open primary state for Democrats. That is, you don't have to be a Democrat to vote in the Democratic primary. But they made it so complex, so complex that, and get, get ready for this number, over one million ballots were never counted because they said that they, that they couldn't be qualified to count in the election, to give you an example of how crazy this is, if you're a, an independent voter in California, NPP, no party preference voter as they call them, you can ask, you can vote in the Democratic primary, but when you ask for a ballot, you have to say the words, it's like mother may I, you have to say the words, give me a crossover Democratic party ballot. Because if you say, for example, in Orange County and in Sonoma, if you said, uh, I want a Democratic Party ballot that say, you can't have one. And they're not allowed to tell you, you mean you want a crossover Democratic Party ballot. You're independent, so you can get a crossover. And you're not allowed to tell the voter that. They were prohibiting even telling the voter what type of ballot that they qualified for. So they couldn't vote. Uh, the other is, um, and, say, and also, they would, or they would give people, if they were independent voters, they were automatically giving them something called provisional ballots, normally given out to black people. In 2012, 2.7 million people were given provisional ballots. That's a placebo ballot. They make you think, you get to feel like you voted, but you haven't. They rarely count those. And uh, so 900,000 voters in California were given provisional ballots, which don't get counted, basically. And so you had thousands and thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of voters independent voters, almost all of them, whose votes never counted. Now here's the trick. According to the Roper poll, which is the gold standard in California in the Golden State, three out of four independent voters favored Bernie Sanders. And so if you take, if you simply say three out of four of those disqualified ballots for stupid technical reasons went to Sanders, not Hillary, if those votes were actually simply counted and not discounted and thrown away, Sanders won California. Sanders won Nevada. Uh, Sanders uh, looks like he won New York again through, now the ACLU and, and uh, uh, New York Public Interest Research Group um, did sue the state successfully. And 125,000 voters that were, were blocked in Brooklyn, for example, were allowed back on the voter rolls. But of course, after the primary. Um, did Sanders therefore win the, the primary on a national basis? That I, I can't say. That, that I'd have to literally, I, I investigated California, I investigated New York, I investigated Nevada. As an investigative reporter, I don't report unless I investigate. I just know the three states I looked at, he got jacked. The Sanders voters got jacked. Well, you saw the tip uh, of the iceberg. Yeah, so whether, how it happened in other states, I don't know. Did it happen in other states? I don't know. I want to be very cautious. I don't want to say Sanders, Sanders won the, the national primary 
by the vote. I do want to say that the that three big states, it was it was a cheat. And, um, you know, so, but, you know, that's why it's sad to see the Democratic Party use these tactics, these basically tactics used in the Jim Crow South to take away votes of, uh, of the Sanders voters. Who, and then it was, the problem is that it's, uh, you know, as John Lennon would say, instant karma, baby. Then they turned around and said, well, now you got to vote for Hillary. <laughs> now we got to wrap. A lot of people said, hmm. Well, you didn't want to count my vote, and now you want it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so um, I think that, that was another monstrous problem for Hillary in Michigan and Wisconsin, where you had virtually a complete collapse of the student vote. A lot of that was through Republican vote suppression techniques, the biggest being a change in the ID laws at the last minute, making it very, very difficult for students to vote in, uh, in Wisconsin and Michigan. And that accounted for a heck of a lot in fact, by itself, it probably count for the uh, count for the margin. But there's not a lot of enthusiasm among students for Clinton. I know from my own uh, college age kids that um, you know uh, they said their friends just didn't want to vote, and uh, a lot of that was because they went to Bernie rallies, they voted for Bernie, and then they were told, "Screw you, and and you better vote for uh, you better vote for Hillary or else." Now. I'm so not, what do we do? We got we got to wrap this up. So I got let me just nail you with a couple of last questions. One, what's the story with Netflix? Can you get it on Netflix? It should be on Netflix. That's one way that alternative uh, films get a lot of coverage. So what's the deal with that? You kind of vaguely got around answering that. What's the Can't story? Talk about it. <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> you can have your own conspiracy theories now. No, I'm not, I can't talk about it. <laughs> I have too many lawyers standing in the in the other room waiting for you know who will tell them who are going to choke me if I if I talk about anything involved. All right, all right, all right. okay. We'll leave but yeah, no, you know what? I'll tell you what. Let's let's forget Netflix. If you're watching this, you can download the film right now from Amazon uh, or from uh, Amazon or uh, you know the usual suspect Vimeo, etc. Or, or buy the film or go to GregPals.com, make a donation, get the film that way. Um, and then if you get the disc or you get a download of the film, tell you what, have a, a, view, a showing party. We've had literally hundreds of people tell us that they've had uh, showing parties. They watch, they think it's great. Other people should see it in their, in their massage circle or their, uh, you know, their, uh, their uh, satanic cult meeting, whatever, they'll show the film. And so you can actually be your own. Uh, don't let the corporation executives, whether it's Netflix or Amazon or anyone else, tell you what you should watch. If somebody has an organization and they want to show the film. Do you work with some organization? Absolutely. We have a, In fact, I'm very happy that we had a special deal in our contracts, which say that the Palace Investigative Fund, again, not our nonprofit entity, can work with any uh, activist groups, nonpartisan, please. Uh, I mean. It, if the Republican or Democratic Party meetings want to show this film, that's great. I'm not going to stop them. But we will work directly with, with nonpartisan groups of any type and activist groups of any type to get you the film so you can show it at your group. Go to gregpalace.com. It says contact Greg. Say, hey, I, want, I, I need a, the latest version because we have updates. I have the latest version of the film for a, sh a showing party here in Columbus, Ohio um, at, my, um, at my Wiccan meeting. Um, so <laughs> we'll be happy to help you out and get those, get those films to you. And also we could, uh, if you want to do a fundraising fact, uh, you know, we'll send you a box of, of the DVDs are super cool. They've got an extras by with Rosario Dawson and ice T and, and, uh, all those cool, uh, folks by the end, by the way, you didn't mention that Willie Nelson's in the film playing a, a stoner musician, believe it or not. William Nelson. <laughs> no, that was funny. Yeah, and so we're telling, yeah, so I mean, it's tragic, but it's a tragic story, but we try to tell it. Look, I'll tell you what, if you're listening to this, I'm going to make you one guarantee. You get the film. If you don't laugh at the beginning of the film and don't cry at the end, I, Greg Palace, will pay for your therapy. Um, <laughs> because that's what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's humor and it's heart, but it's important. And, and this, and by the way, yesterday, and this really uh, picked picked up my spirits. Last night at midnight, I got a note. After I was, I was personally attacked by the, uh, uh, physically, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, on TV, by the Republican candidate for Congress in Georgia. And, and after that, right after I got that information, I got the, the 
uh, the attorney for the Georgia NAACP asked me if he could have a special showing of my film for the NAACP in Georgia. And, and absolutely, the answer, sir, is yes. And why don't you join the NAACP, not only as a member, but join them in watching this film because he saw it and he loved it and he wanted everyone in Georgia to see it, every voter activist in the country. Now, you so, have a prediction about the Ossoff election. You basically say... What is they, 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 stole it, they stole the first round. Ossoff won the first round. I'm, I'm not a friend of Ossoff. I don't know who he is or give a damn, frankly. It's not my... It, I, I don't take sides. But they did use this, this woman. He's running against Susan Handel. She was Secretary of State. And she uh, was a big promoter of, of purging the voter rolls in the district in which she's running. So she removed, and, and not only that, but the Republican Secretary of State's office shut down the Asian American voter drive. They had a voter drive called 10,000 Korean Votes because a huge, the sixth uh, congressional district, a huge Asian American community in the, in the tech fields and, and uh, out there in Alpharetta and, and, uh, and northern suburbs of Atlanta, and um, they, they actually purged thousands of, of Asian Americans from the voter rolls. They shut down their voter drives and threatened the, 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 the people running the voter drive with criminal charges. Um, and that was, that was the margin, removing the Asian American voters from the voter rolls. In fact, that group, and, and, and now, and also another group, uh, New Georgia Project, registered 86,000 voters 40,000 of those voters' names never, never made the voter rolls. They literally deep-sixed 40,000 voter registration forms. And we know that because New Georgia Project photocopied those registration forms. So when the Secretary of State said, we don't know what forms you're talking about, they said, these 40,000 registration forms you have not entered onto the voter rolls. These 40,000. And basically they said, well, they, they threatened the New Georgia project with criminal, uh, with criminal charges if they, if they stop, unless they stop pushing. But um, these are old fighters against Jim Crow in the South, and they won't back down. But still, the voter rolls of the 6th of the District have been completely, have been well cleansed of black voters and Asian American voters. And that's the margin for Ossoff. So I don't see how he can win Despite his lead in the polls, despite the demographics of the district, I don't see how he can win because they're just literally just going to steal it in front of your face. So what do we do about all this? What does Ossoff do? And, and how do we, we fix this massive long-term problem? What Ossoff does, I don't care. I can tell you what we have to do. And by the way, just so you know, when I, I did ask um, the Republican, Karen Handel, about her removing um, black people from the voter rolls. But before that, by the way, and she said in, last night in the debate, uh, she said in the debate in Georgia, um, that she was accosted by this reporter. Well, I know, I would, didn't she was accosted, she was asked a question. She was asked a question, um, are the Democrats stealing this election from you? And that she was very happy to answer, oh, yes, they're pulling out all this out, oh, yes. And she was really happy that I'd asked her about that. But then I said, now, I'm Republican stealing the election. You eliminated black voters from the voter rolls using cross-check and other tricks. Um, did you do that so you could win this race? Then three deep-fried, big, fat, white guys, and I'm not trying to be ethnic here, but you got to know that, you know, that's, their, that's who we got here. Three big, chunky, white guys. One just right in, in front of me pushes body blocks and, you know, checks me back. And two other guys grab my arms. I have this on film, by the way. I, you know, where she answers the question, but the second question she didn't like, so I'm literally physically slammed and pulled away. And um, they try to stop me from asking her the questions. So then she gets on TV and says she was accosted by a reporter. Because remember, Atlanta, uh, they don't have reporters in Atlanta, by the way. They just have repeaters. And so the repeaters tell them, you know, repeat whatever they want them to say. Uh, but uh, so she's never actually seen a reporter before. And so she said she was accosted by a reporter. It means I asked her a question that she didn't like. And, um, uh, but what they should do is, is people should get wise. Check your, by the way, always check your registration. Make sure you are registered because um, they'll remove it. 
I don't care if you voted for 20 years at the same polling station, look out. And, but the other thing is we gotta, please join with the New Georgia Project, please join with the NAACP, please join with the Palace Investigative Fund because we are launching a nationwide campaign to stop, cross-check a nationwide campaign to stop the new Jim Crow voting, uh, voting games. That's what we're doing. Sounds like a good place to wrap. Anything else you want to finish with? I'll go to, and by the way, one thing you can do, uh, yeah, download the film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. Read the book until Patriot Act 3. That's your permitted to read the book, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, the new edition, The Tale of Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. And uh, you get that at gregpalace.com or the usual suspects and your local uh, bookstore. And the other is um, go to gregpalast.com, G-R-E-G-P-A-L-A-S-T.com and sign up free for, um, for my uh, investigative reports, even for Rolling Stone. I put them out on the net, not just uh, in these papers and my reports for Democracy Now! And by the way, and my reports in Op-Ed News, which is a fantastic outlet for the no BS truth. And this is a free ad for you, Bob, because your work is wonderful. I, I read Op-Ed News. Because uh, I don't want, I want to unstupid myself. I'm going to get the real information. Op-Ed News. And, and I, I'm thrilled to, to uh, have your uh, news service carry my reports. It, it really makes me feel terrific to know that there is an outlet that will always stand by me when I've got the real facts in my hand and I want to get it out to you. You're doing great work. Thanks so much, Greg. Really You're very welcome. Greg Palestine, signing off.